as I mentioned in the announcement, if you're struggling here, it might be the format more than it is the material or you. The virtual format is, is not the most conducive uh, for the a and class. It, 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 it's just not as, as personal and, and hands-on as, as you would like in this sort of situation, but it will work. Um, but that being said, like I said, if, you, if you're struggling, you might consider the in-person section. Um, other things here, uh, especially in this eight-week format, things move very, very quickly. So you cannot get behind. Um, in the in-person class, if you miss a day or, or something happens and you're sick, we can get you caught up here. There is no opportunity for that because things just move so quickly in this eight-week format. So you've got to stay ahead of things and on top of the lectures and the exams. Don't get behind. The thing with this, as we go through this, is this is not like, you know, algebra or whatever, where you, you get to take that class and, and you never use that ever, ever again. Here, you're going to use this all the time. This is, this is what everything is based on. So if you really hate this, something to consider is, is your career path because this is pretty much what the nursing path is, is just applying your knowledge of anatomy and physiology. So keep that in mind as we go through. All right, so anatomy. Anatomy is where stuff is. This part's easy. Anatomy is what we call a complete science, meaning that we've named all the parts, we know where the stuff is. Stuff might get renamed, we might be more specific, but we're not discovering any new body parts. We're good. We've got this, it's great. Um, anatomy is the easy part of this. It's just naming where the structures are. Physiology is then how things work. All the processes that are involved there. This is where things get complicated. We're very complicated organisms. Uh, lots and lots of processes going on to make you work all the time. The thing is, is that those two concepts are really difficult to separate. Anatomy is the result of physiology, meaning that things are where they are because that's where they work right. And at the same time, all physiology is made possible by anatomy. Things don't work right if they're not in the right place. For example, uh, one of my kids was born with a congenital heart defect where the two major blood vessels coming off his heart were reversed. That meant that his heart was pumping high oxygen blood back to the lungs and low oxygen blood back out to the body. And we had two separate circuits and this had to be surgically corrected immediately after birth because physiology was not able to maintain without the anatomy being correct. So those two ideas are really tightly tied together. Let's talk about anatomy and where we're coming from here. Again, you're not going to be tested over the history of anatomy. It's just an interesting subject, and we'll, um, we'll go through it kind of briefly here. Um, we have records of anatomical studies as early as 1600 BC. Uh, this is the Smith Surgical Papyrus. Um, it's a, a medical treatise, one of the earliest Egyptian uh, records we have. Um, it identifies the heart as the center of the blood supply, but also for all the other body fluids. Um, the Egyptians, I mean, it, it's 1600 BC. Like, they didn't have a whole lot of equipment here. Knives, basically. They were mummifying dead people. Um, they didn't know where sweat came from or saliva came from. For all they could figure out, it was magic. Um, they were pretty sure that the heart was the only important organ in the body. This was... Uh, exemplified here by the fact that when they would mummify your corpse, they'd drop the brain in the trash can and then put the heart in a jar because you were going to need the heart later. But the brain, screw that, you're not going to ever use that. That idea of the heart being the center of everything stuck around for a while. 
Um, we go forward, uh, you know, 1,200 years. Uh, the Greeks started naming things. The Greeks decided to name everything. Uh, they decided that was sort of their job. And uh, most of our anatomical terms will either be Latin or Greek. This is Hippocrates. Hippocrates is the father of medicine. The reason Hippocrates is called the father of medicine is because he was the first physician to reject um, supernatural causes of illness. Before Hippocrates, if you were sick, it was because God was mad at you. You had done something to earn that. Hippocrates argued that it wasn't necessarily God being mad at you, it was something in the environment. Uh, unfortunately, Hippocrates created an idea called humorism, which was the idea that your body had four fluids in it, and if you could balance those out, everything was cool. The unfortunate part there is that stuck around until, you know, the mid-1800s, sometimes a little later than that, which meant that we kept uh, a procedure called bleeding uh, into in the medical field for a long time, and so you would bleed patients. Um, they'd come in, they'd be sick, and you would take blood out of them to try to balance out the humors, which is nonsense and not helpful. This becomes a theme for us in science in general, where it's difficult to go against uh, an authority. So this is Hippocrates, he's the father of medicine, and these ideas of humorism stuck around because no one was willing to challenge that idea. Keep your eye on that because that becomes a sort of a running theme. Um, in the mid 14th century, Aristotle, who's mainly known as a philosopher, Aristotle was also doing some science here. He was dissecting animals, identified the difference between arteries and veins. Um, Aristotle is the founder of comparative anatomy, where we look at different animals and how the, the inner anatomy differs. So that the heart was the center of consciousness. The very first school of anatomy was in Alexandria. Now, Alexandria is Egypt. Um, Alexander the Great conquered Egypt and put his friend in charge. The Egyptians decided he was the pharaoh, and we just went with that. Um, so uh, Ptolemy was this guy that Alexander the Great put in charge. Um, got this guy, Herophilus, and said, you're in charge of science. Herophilus is the father of anatomy. He reversed that idea that the heart was the center of your intelligence. How did he figure this out? Well, Herophilus did things called vivisections. A vivisection is when you dissect someone who's still alive. He did this on at least 600 condemned criminals. Now, by condemned criminals, I mean... Um, people they didn't like. So, um, Father of Anatomy, also mass murderer. Um, what did we learn from dissecting people who were still alive? Um, they don't like that. And, you know, everything else. Um, that's really yay science. Um, we only know those works exist um, from further records. The actual documents were lost when uh, Julius Caesar burned the Great Library of Alexandria in 272 AD. Around 150 AD, before that had burned, um, a guy named Galen used the works of Herophilus to write what we would consider really the first anatomy text. Um, Galen was the physician to the Roman gladiators, and he didn't actually have to dissect people, you know, they're kind of dissecting themselves and the whole gladiator thing. And so in, in treating that, he learned a lot. Um, he was performing vivisections on animals, which is what you see in this engraving. Um, so slightly less of a psychopath than Herophilus. I mean, he's just cutting up in dogs. It's not people. They're still alive, so still messed up. Um, yay, science, again. And much like the works of Herophilus, we don't actually have the, the works of Galen. The only reason we know they exist is because someone else made note of that. Um, during the medieval times, we kind of stopped doing science. We decided we knew everything. They thought that Galen had, had gone through this, these works of Herophilus, and between the two of them, everything we knew was there. 
that we didn't need to study anything else. We've got this done. There's nothing else to be learned. Um, any sort of anatomical studies that were being done were used by, uh, like we'd copy this stuff down by hand. Books, you know, there wasn't like a printing press, so like books were extremely expensive. They had to be hand copied. Um, and, and this sort of knowledge was limited to very few people. Um, here we see this uh, etching of priests trying to bless away the plague. That's not working out for them. Now this was mostly in Europe. Um, in the Middle East, this is the Persian physician Avicenna. He used the works of Galen to write the Canon of Medicine. Now the Canon of Medicine is a major text and he wrote it at around 1020 AD. So, you know, more than a thousand years ago. And that's the only reason we know the works of Galen actually existed. That's because Avicenna mostly used them to write his text. Now, the canon of medicine became the medical textbook until at least the 1600s. So what that means for medicine is that these authoritative medical texts for 1,500 years, your doctors learned from these books and they learned to practice medicine based on the anatomy of dogs. Doctors would go for medical education. They would attend a dissection and that would be done by a barber. Uh, another physician or professor would direct that dissection, but doctors didn't get their hands dirty. That was beneath them. So you've got a barber to do it. Why a barber? I guess because he's already got a razor. Just, you know, cut more. So, um, dogs are different than people. And so during the dissection, it was not uncommon for the barber to not be able to find something that was in Galen's book or, or Avicenna's book. Um, if that happened, the professor would then say the cadaver was wrong, not the book. Once again, this inability to sort of go against this authoritative science um, became a, a sticking point. And here in medicine, that's really uh, important. So for 1,500 years, you know, it sucked. There's not a lot you could do because um, your doctor assumed that they knew everything. And in reality, they had just learned how the inside of a dog looks. Around 1530, this guy, uh, Andreas Vesalius, graduated medical school. As soon as he was out, they, they offered him the chair of surgery at this uh, university. Um, Vesalius was the first to perform the dissections himself. He's the founder of modern anatomy. Not a mass murderer. We like him better. Um, he was the first person to uh, encourage students to participate in dissections. The first one to point out that Galen was dissecting dogs and not people. No one had noticed or bothered to challenge that before him. Um, the first person to uh, realize that the description that Galen made about the heart and the arteries and veins was wrong. 1500 years, doctors just assumed that there was an opening between the chambers of the heart that doesn't exist. Vesalius was the first to say, yeah, that's not a thing. So now we can move forward. As we get to this point and the printing press is invented, we can make copies of books now. Now keep in mind, they're still in Latin for the most part, which makes life difficult. But now that we can make copies and with the printing press, we can use the drawings as well. And so in the 17th and 18th centuries, so the 16, 1700s, late 1500s, um, we had artists that would travel along with anatomists and do these anatomical drawings. It was quick money for them. And then even if you couldn't read the Latin, you could still see the pictures. And so now uh, we can start spreading this, this knowledge out. Um, 
This is, I believe, a, a Michelangelo sketch at the bottom. I'm here's a Da Vinci study of the arm. This is a painting called The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp by Rembrandt. Um, Dr. Tulp was the mayor of Amsterdam, and uh, Amsterdam was a, a center for anatomical studies. They'd have like these Renaissance fairs in the Renaissance, I guess, that were like anatomy fairs, and all the anatomy geeks would show up and buy refreshments and t-shirts or whatever. And it was a big money thing for the city, and uh, Dr. Tulp got to dissect some dead people. Public dissections. Um, where did you get the cadavers? Well, at the time, we are executing a lot of people. It didn't take much to get executed. So they'd hang you, and then if they were really mad, they'd dissect you too. Um, anatomists traveled a lot to get fresh cadavers. Um, apparently, Italy was a great place to go. Amsterdam as well. Um, we'd have these public dissections. Now, what you see here is fairly accurate. Like, these people in the background want to be doctors, or they are doctors, and they paid money to go see the guy in black dissect this dead dude. That's how this worked. You want to be a doctor, how do you be a doctor? Well, you need to learn this. How are you going to learn this? Well, pay some guy to dissect a dead dude. Think for-profit colleges like whatever, University of Phoenix, um, or some of those other colleges, they are for profit, but a cadaver. So you'd go to this guy's house, or um, in this case, like probably City Hall or whatever in Amsterdam, and he's got a dead guy, pay him 50 bucks, and you get to watch. This got messy. Um, in the 1800s, um, anatomy was super mainstream. This system stuck around. And the demand for cadavers went up, but the supply of cadavers went down because by the time we hit the 1800s, they stopped hanging people for random things. Um, so how do you get a cadaver? You freaking steal it. Um, body snatching um, was a, a living. Um, they were people who stole bodies were called resurrectionists, and they would uh, steal a body and then go sell it to a doctor who would then charge you 20 bucks or whatever to come watch the dissection. Um, people had to guard corpses after death and make sure they didn't get stolen. Um, at some point, someone just cut to the chase and started killing people. Um, the best case of that are these guys, uh, Burke and Hare. They had a boarding house in Scotland. Um, they, they had a guy that died, he owed the money, they sold his body to this doctor, the doctor's like, hey, where'd you get this? And they're like, we found it. And he's like, cool, if you find any more, you know, I'm here. Good deal. So a month later, they needed some money, and so they just suffocated a guy. Um, he was probably going to die anyway, it's fine. And they took him to the doctor, and they're like, hey, you found another one. He's like, yeah, there's just dead bodies everywhere, right? And so um, then it kind of became a thing. Um, they become accustomed to a standard of living, I guess, and they would uh, go to a bar, find someone, get them super drunk, um, drag them back to their place, get them drunk, -er, and then when they'd pass out, they'd finish them off. Even if they'd gotten caught, it's not like they could prove that they had killed them. We know, like CSI, if they, even if they'd gotten caught, they didn't stab them or poison them. So, I mean, they just dropped dead as far as anybody would know. So, there weren't any rules. I mean, they were murdering people. That's not cool, but about cadavers. So, then they just, like, call of a cadaver. Eventually, the cops caught them with a body. Through something, they got one of them to testify against the other one. One of them got away free. The other one um, was hanged and dissected publicly. Um, during his dissection, the doctor made notes, the guy's blood, and skinned him and made stuff out of his skin. Honestly, the doctor was probably also a serial killer. Um, if you look at that little book, it says Burke's Skin Pocketbook. Like the doctor made a book out of his skin and carried it around. There's a calling card case that he carried around, made from human skin. The doctor was also a serial killer, 100%. Like, 
There's no doubt. Um, there's his skeleton, which is still on display. That'll show him. Let this be a lesson to you. If you kill people and sell them to doctors, you're going to get dissected, and we're going to put your skeleton in a museum forever. Yeah, so that's weird. Um, but the anatomist at the time was like an executioner plus. Like, if you got executed, okay, well, I mean, you got me. But if they executed you and dissected you, it was like, like a worse than death. It's like kicking you when you're down. And if they kept stuff, like they preserved your skeleton, you're like the worst. That's weird. Um, so, obviously a problem. We gotta fix this. So in Great Britain, they passed what's called the Medical Act. Now, keep in mind, these are like for-profit things. Um, at the time, women could not attend medical school, but you could go to dissections. You, uh, you've got the money, they've got the body, and you could go to the dissection. Um, and it wasn't until the Medical Act got passed in 1832 that medical school anat anatomy got regulated. The Medical Act of 1832 passed in Great Britain made it difficult to obtain cadavers. You couldn't just go find a body in the street anymore. It had to be legit. It had to be legal paperwork, and it, it made rules about how we deal with dead bodies. Um, it's not just public domain if you die somewhere. Like, that body has to be handled correctly, and there are rules. And so dissection shifted from events um, that were sort of public or in somebody's house to the classroom, usually within a hospital or university, because of the rules that were set forth. Now, meanwhile, in the United States, in the early 1800s, we only had one medical school. So um, this is right after the American Revolution. The, the medical school was right next door to a cemetery, which was, you know, suspicious. Um, in 1788, they caught some medical students stealing bodies from the cemetery, but it was a cemetery designated just for slaves, so no one really did anything about it. Then we had an issue. Um, it was one thing for them to be stealing, you know, um, bodies out of the slave cemetery because people didn't care. And then it was another thing entirely when they started stealing bodies out of the other cemeteries. So this is the stupidest story ever. The whole situation here is stupid. Um, and this sounds like I'm making it up. It's totally, I'm not totally not making this up. Um, so these are terrible people. Um, one day, uh, there's kids that are playing outside the hospital, which I guess was a thing. Um, they had a student dissecting a corpse. And he opened the window and waved at these kids using the corpse's arm. The kids freaked out um, a little bit. And he told one kid that, hey, it's your mom's arm. So, the kid's mom had recently died. He ran home and told his dad. And... Reportedly, it actually was his mom that they were dissecting, and they had stolen the body. At the very least, they had stolen the lady's body. Um, they figured this out. Then it was on. Um, roughly 2,000 people surrounded the hospital. It's a wonder they didn't burn the, the hospital in New York City to the ground. They dragged medical students outside and beat them. Um, they found lots of bodies that they had stolen from all over the place. Um, the governor had to call in, like, the militia to stop them. Um, at least six people were killed. Rioters, people from the army, like, it was on. And, again, it's a wonder they didn't burn down the only hospital they had. Which they totally deserved. Um, so, after that, we put laws in place to stop that. They told the medical students, you can't steal bodies. So the medical students hired people to steal bodies. And that went on for like a hundred years. And most states by that point had passed laws prohibiting stealing of bodies at all. It also made provisions so that uh, medical schools could take the bodies of criminals and poor people. We were fine with that still. So if you were super poor and 
you got buried like poppers graves or whatever unmarked grave yeah that's cool nobody cares it is cool none of this was cool this was all super sketchy and and horrible um we still use cadavers today but today cadavers are donated to university you donate your body to science it's your choice we don't go steal bodies because you know that's terrible so cadavers are donated you die you donate your body it's called the willed body program um and lots of people do this it's a noble act um it's the last thing that you can you know give of yourself is is your cadaver and doctors learn um we could even do um anatomical studies on living patients with the imaging equipment we have today um, we'll do some of this uh with our anatomos table as we go through our labs later um, the anatomos table is a remarkable thing that we've got here um, and if you come to the in-person class you can play with the table i um, we can upload MRI CT scans of living patients in there and it renders them back in three dimensions and we can dissect people that are not dead. Now what we know about the body comes from hundreds and hundreds of years of scientific study. Today when we talk about things that are scientific we're being very very specific. Science yields testable reliable objective results. When we say something is scientific it has to meet certain criteria. Now, this is important for medicine and this class. If you haven't had like a, a science science class like this before, um, this is important for us. And we'll talk about why in just a second. So the first rule in science is it's never proven, it's only disproven. Um, you have to be able to falsify the idea. When we do experiments, we have a hypothesis and we experiment to falsify that. We don't try to prove ourselves right. We look for the ways that this idea could be wrong. Now, because of that, science always changes. Technology gets better, and we learn more, and science changes. Today, that can happen very quickly because technology is advancing so very quickly. So what we know changes fairly routinely. Examples of this falsifiability, and this is an oversimplified example. Our first statement here, Bigfoot's real. You can totally prove that, just produce Bigfoot. You can't disprove that. And if you talk to like the Bigfoot people that are out there chasing Bigfoot, they're like, you can't prove there's not a Bigfoot. You can't disprove this idea, and that's true. You'd have to survey every inch of the planet simultaneously, make sure you got all the hiding places, check all the animals, make sure none of them are like disguised or whatever. We can't do that. Now, we don't have any evidence. We, have, we don't have a Bigfoot. So statement two here, Bigfoot doesn't exist. You can easily falsify that. Bring in Bigfoot. The moment you do that, like, okay, we were wrong. You falsified that. But you can't ever prove that. But since no one's actually produced evidence of Bigfoot, that's what we've got. Now, again, this is oversimplified. But that's the idea. Science is always falsifiable. It changes. It's also testable through either experimentation or observation. If you can't test it, if you can't observe something happening, it's not a scientific idea. I mean, you have to take it on faith. That's, that's really not scientific. So we can test things like genes that code for sp skin pigmentation. We can't test stuff like the Bermuda Triangle. We can't test things like ghosts. Science is repeatable. When we do experiments, you should be able to see this repeatedly. This is extremely important for medicine when we talk about pharmaceuticals. Um, pharmaceutical companies test medications thousands and thousands of times before they ever see human trials, and then they go through human trials for years before they ever hit the market because we don't want to mess it up. You don't want to have a drug that you're like, well, I made that guy's hair grow back. Sell it and then everybody else it makes them sick. So repeatability is important. The last thing is that science is public. When I say science is public, it's published in peer-reviewed journals. Science doesn't get published in a magazine, or a book, or on freaking Facebook. It's published in journals that other scientists read 
and then other scientists attempt to repeat those results and they, they determine the validity of the work. It's reviewed by other scientists, by other experts in the field. Unfortunately today, that line between what is science and what's not science gets really blurry. And that is really difficult for medicine. So from a, a medical education standpoint, it is really important for you to understand the difference between science and not science. Science-based medicine is what we're aiming at here, not magic. It's important that you understand how physiology and how medicine works so that we're not just taking this on faith. So pseudosciences are the terms that we use for uh, fake science. Um, pseudoscience is characterized by these sort of vague claims they're exaggerated. They're things that you can't falsify, like cryptozoology or the ghost hunting thing, which is super awesome and amusing. Um, the people you're looking for UFOs, most of that's very entertaining and super harmless. Like, I don't care if people are out there looking for Bigfoot, it's not hurting me, and it makes for good television. But when it comes to medicine, people die. So here's an idea. Here's this process called psychic surgery. If you've never seen psychic surgery, it's amazing. It's much like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom where they, they pulls that kid's heart out. Um, here, there, you can see this guy. Like he, It looks like he's reaching into this lady's abdomen and pulling out a tumor. It does not leave a mark on the skin. Just reaches in with his bare hand. Give that two seconds thought. And obviously, you can't reach into someone's skin barehanded and pull something out and not leave a mark on the skin. That's not how the body works. That's freaking magic. And that's not a thing. This is a, in reality, what this is, is just a, a, a wonderful sleight of hand trick um, that magicians could probably show you how to do. But here, this guy's charging her a considerable amount of money to pull out this cancer. Well, she still has cancer. Um, this is Andy Kaufman, if you're unfamiliar, he was a comedian in like the 70s, and um, he had lung cancer. So he, they're like, hey, you've got lung cancer, we need to take out the tumor. And he's like, I want a second opinion from a witch doctor. And so then he goes and gets psychic surgery, and they're like, hey, you're cancer free. He was not, he died of lung cancer. Should have, you know, stuck with the surgery thing. Um, these are essential oils. Essential oils, um, manufacturers claim they can treat diseases or prevent infection. There's absolutely no science for this. Um, they're very popular. They make your room smell better. But there's no benefit scientifically to doing this. We have no studies that say this is helpful whatsoever. And, and you'll have people that are like, oh, this helps me a lot. Great, but it doesn't. Um, in 2014, the FDA actually had to issue warnings because the essential oil companies were claiming that they could prevent Ebola. And in 2014 is when we had, uh, yeah, 2014 was when we had the Ebola outbreak in Houston. And immediately they're like, hey, you can prevent Ebola. And the FDA was like, nope, time out. No, we don't, we don't need like an Ebola outbreak because people are like, it's a matter of I'm vomiting blood. I'm taking the oils. Not helpful. Um, the same thing happened with COVID. Where they're like, you don't use this oil and don't get COVID. You still got COVID. So this is not helpful. Um, why do they exist at all? One is what I hope to help with this semester. It's just a lack of knowledge of how your body works. Once you learn how your body works, you can look at this stuff and say, yeah, that's not right. You know, that's not going to help. I can't put um, pads in my shoes to take over for the function of my kidneys. I can't put a bracelet on and, and it, it fixes my muscles um, or nerve pain or whatever. That's not how that works. Um, placebo effect is a real thing. There's nothing wrong with a placebo if you have a patient, especially patients that are in chronic pain, 
that's not treatable. And if it makes them feel better and we can't fix it, rock on. But if it makes them feel better and we could fix it, it's just allowing the disease to progress. Like, you may go get the psychic surgery and you're like, I feel cancer free. You're not. That's not helpful. Um, regression fallacy is the idea that something that you did fixed it. You're so, it's a little self-important. So, like, we all do this. Like, you get a cold, and you've got a cold for, like, five or six days, and then you break down, and you're like, I'm going to take these vitamin C tablets. And then you take the vitamin C tablets, and, like, ten days into your, your illness, you're better, and you're like, ah, I fixed it with the vitamin C tablets. Magically, ten days after it started, and my immune system was doing its job. You're just giving yourself credit for something that's happening. That's regression fallacy. Um, we have a distrust of medicine. Some of that's because of the lack of understanding of how science works and science-based medicine, but we tend to distrust medicine. Um, fear is one. Cost is another. And the fear of the cost of medicine, especially here. Um, desperation, like you're at your wit's end, like nothing is helping. Let's try this. Um, pride, especially when you've spent a lot of money on some of these ridiculous treatments and you don't want to admit that you've gotten ripped off and then sometimes it's just full on fraud like you see the snake oil thing over here treats everything yeah there's nothing in that either um so people get mad about this they get outraged about this skepticism like what's the harm you get to believe what you want to believe actually you don't um science doesn't care what you believe and, and medicine doesn't either. Um, there's a lot of harm to this. Currently, 20% of Americans believe that vaccines cause autism. 37% uh, of Americans believe the government suppresses natural cures to aid pharmaceutical companies. Um, I promise you, if there was a natural treatment for diseases, pharmaceutical companies would sell it to you. If, if honey cured cancer, Pfizer would have a patent on it, and it would cost a lot more money. I mean, aspirin comes from a plant, and we sell that. Like, there's a profit to be made. And most of your, uh, like, vitamin and natural supplement companies are owned by bigger pharmaceutical companies. Like, they would bank on this. So nothing's getting suppressed here. I mean, if it worked, we'd know about it. Um, and vaccines don't cause autism. That's a, that's a story for next semester. Um, in the developing countries, pseudoscience is a bigger issue as well. Um, for instance, in uh, South Africa, around 30% of the population believes that witchcraft causes HIV. 20% um, think that the CIA may have, may have created it. And 20% believe that condoms contain the virus. And that's how you get HIV, is by using protection. Around 3 million people die every year from vaccine-preventable illness. I'm not talking about COVID. Other illnesses like measles. And quite often, people will delay treatments and search for natural cures. This can be problematic. Like, you have a person that needs spinal surgery, and they're like, I'm going to go for natural medicine, and their vertebrae are just getting more and more deteriorated. It's not helping, and then it's a much more intensive surgery. Even dentists have this issue where people are going to naturally cure cavities, and by the time they come into the dentist, they have to pull the tooth. So the trick here is you as a future healthcare practitioner distinguishing like science-based medicine from which doctor crap. Um, how do you do that? The first is the source. Facebook, um, freaking Dr. Oz, other things, these are not legitimate sources. Facebook is not how we learn medicine. Um, the second thing, uh, the plural of anecdote is not data. Just because there's a whole message board full of people who are like, oh, yeah, I took the horse warmer and I fixed COVID. That's not science. And we, that's not how we do things. Like, we're not just screwing around um, and posting it on Facebook full of stuff. Um, the last thing here is, is this knowledge of how your physiology works. Common sense. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. Um, this is one point that 
we'll be sort of coming back to you through the semester is this idea of science-based medicine. I care because I need you to have a working knowledge of physiology here because at some point you're probably going to see one of my kids. I've got six of these guys. Yeah, I get six kids, six boys. So like I have a punch card at the emergency room basically, like they know me. We're there. Um, because these guys, you know, they're not, you know, the most safe people, like they're always doing something. Um, so I care, like that, that, you know, we're using science-based medicine to treat actual illnesses here. Um, for instance, once things, you understand how muscles work, you're not going to recommend that people sleep with a bar of soap under their mattress. That's actually a thing. Um, people will tell you that, how do you fix muscle cramps? Put a bar of soap under your mattress. How's that supposed to work? Right, you put a bar of soap under your mattress and it absorbs like cramps. What happens if you use the soap? Does it matter what kind of soap? What happens if you give somebody else the soap and they use it? Did they get the cramps? I have so many questions here. Oh, that's not going to work at all. How did the cramps get through the mattress? What's with the soap? What if I put something else there? None of this makes any sense. But people take it, they're like, oh, well, it's going to work because somebody said it. No. Science-based medicine is what we're going for here. Okay. So, um, I'm going to pause right here and uh, post a separate video for the rest of this um, a bit later today. And we'll pick up here as we talk about anatomical terminology. Um, so the, the second video will be shorter than this, but I will post it in a little bit.